Welcome to Family Church. I'm so glad you could join us wherever you're watching from. I want to remind you we're in the middle of a series about unconditional love. And I thought before we get into our message, let's just recap a couple of key concepts to help us understand where we're going to go in today's message. And first, I want to start with a verse. It comes out of Mark, and this is a time when Jesus was talking, and he was really being challenged on what is important. What is the most important thing we can do? What are these commandments? And he says this, he says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, to love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. And we've been talking about, first, have you received God's love? How are you doing at receiving his agape love, his unconditional love? Are you experiencing that? And then second, we said, once you've learned to accept the love of God, are you loving him back? That second, most important part, he loves me. Will I love him back unconditionally? Am I doing that? How are you doing? That's the, we talk about this, this, vertical relationship, and then we talk about the horizontal, that if I'm not in relationship with God, not only accepting his love, but loving him back, that I'm going to really struggle on those horizontal relationships with my neighbors, with the people in my church groups, and wherever it is that I go in this world. So I want to start there to say, how are you doing in accepting God's love, loving him, and then of course, loving others. And that's really where we're going to focus on today, is loving others as a result of this. I've titled the message Unlovable because I think we view people through a lens of whether or not they're worthy of our love. And I can remember this time. It was, it was an interesting moment. We were at this campus, and I had uh, Pastor Paul, Pastor Will, and Pastor Jason happen to be here for the weekend service. We had other campuses covered, and uh, we're just kind of hanging out, greeting people. And all of a sudden, this guy pulls up in a car that's very nice. He's kind of new to the area. We had never really met him before. And, and he shows up, gets out of the car, and what you see him wearing is just really a nice suit. Like you can tell a nice suit. And he had gold rings and big watch. And, you know, there was something about him that he just drew attention. And man, I just watched as Paul and Will, they were out in the lobby and uh, they just kind of flocked to him like, oh, hey, what's your name? How are you? And simultaneously, just right behind him, another guy came in, kind of looked like he had just sort of rolled out of bed, maybe out of the, the bushes. I mean, he just was not very clean. He was not very well kept. And as I watched as, as Paul and Will brought this finely dressed guy into the auditorium, and there was Jason, and they kind of gathered around him and said, oh, welcome to Family Church. So glad you're here. And they sat him down, gave him kind of like, hey, here's a great place for you. And then there was this other guy, though, and I kind of watched and marveled as, as Paul left that that greeting time went over and just said, hey, good morning, and said, you can take a seat here if you'd like, and just kind of went on his way. Before you jump to any kind of uh, conclusions, I, I wonder, how do you feel about that? Who did you judge in that story? How are you doing? And in, in who's, who's the person that gave you the most conflict? Was it, did you feel empathy for the one who perhaps wasn't dressed well? Are you casting judgment on Paul or Will so, or Jason? Or before you go any further, you have to know that is not a real story. In fact, you probably should be mad at me for even telling that story because that is not their heart. But, but I think it lays a foundation for today's, really the focus I want to draw you into. Who's lovable in your life? And it brings me to James chapter two. If you want to open your Bibles up, open your apps, take a look at it because this is a place where a story like that really happened. James chapter 2, I'm going to start right in here on verse 3. It says this, If you show special attention to the man wearing the fine clothes and say, Here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, "Uh, You stand here, sit on the floor at my feet. Have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Oh, evil thoughts. When I look at people for their outward appearance or something that, that is different, It says those are evil thoughts to treat him that way. And then it goes on. He says this in verse 5. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has God not chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you've dishonored the poor. So God has this definite love for all people, but he says specifically, you've dishonored the poor. I'm raising them up. 
but he skips on to verse eight for a moment because I want to get to this point. He says, if you really kept that laurel, that royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Today, I want to focus on the sin of favoritism. We're told here that just how I interact with people, how I choose to engage with people, there's a a tendency for favoritism that the Bible calls out very clearly as sin. And sometimes we say, no, they're just a different personality. But the real question is, am I willing to engage in them? And in verse 9, it said it very clearly. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. That hits me really hard. Because it's so easy to step into the the judgment category of looking at people and making decisions about them without ever knowing them. And so I see favoritism play out really kind of in three key areas. First one, if you take a look at this picture, the outward appearance. Whether it's somebody who attends your church or your life group, someone who walks into some circle of people that you know, we often jump to the first place where their appearance is what we go after rather than their heart. Rather than desiring to build relationship, to find out what their heart need is, we make a quick judgment and we show favoritism perhaps to push them aside. The sin of favoritism is when we have a passion or maybe that's a strong word, but a preference over their appearance rather than desire to know their heart. That's one of the roots that I see happening. And it's not (laughs) pointing fingers here at you. It's pointing them at me. I step into this so easily. I wish that wasn't true, and I, I continually work on it, but it is difficult. The appearance is tough to come over. And then you get another one. You look at this. Here's another appearance one. For some of you, whoa, that is really stark. If this person were a part of your congregation, let me ask you this. If they were a part of your life group or your house group or wherever you meet, if this is not comfortable to you to look at this face, if it it stirs an emotion in you, would they ever be welcome into your Christian circle, into your church? See, I'm afraid that what we run into, the second thing I notice in the sin of favoritism is that we devalue God's values. Now, that person has created an image for themselves, but they are still made in the image of God. It may not look the way we think it should look, but God goes to the heart. I guess I have to ask the question. That's a stark image. That that face that that person has created is very uh, off-putting for my personality. For others, they'd say, no, no problem. You're welcome. It's funny how, depending on where we come from and what our background is, how we react to different personalities, different people, different ways of seeing. But we ultimately devalue what God values. We place on them judgments about their character without really seeking to know them. We devalue God's values. And of course, if you've never been the person on the bench, the one who didn't get chosen, You may not understand this, but I'll bet almost all of you have had moments in your life where you felt like the outsider. I think about these kids and and the one in the middle with kind of the two friends around them. How many times in, in, in your church setting, in your life group setting, wherever it is, how many times have you perhaps not even realized that you created that environment of somebody feeling like an outsider? And what I find, the sin of favoritism the root of it is that we're selfish. We, we live in a, a kind of a mindset. They're not okay, but I am. Or more importantly, they're not really worth the time because they're not going to do anything for me. I don't think I'm going to gain anything by investing time with them. Because what I'm looking for are relationships that elevate me, that help me, that I can depend on for me. Notice the me problem. <laughs> selfish. I think we're selfish, and so favoritism plays out in our selfishness. It happens in nature, too. Take a look at that picture. I wonder, have you ever been crushed under the weight of favoritism? 
when you first saw the picture, some of you thought, oh, that's so cool. I love to see when birds are feeding each other. But I'm wondering, did you notice this? Did you notice this bird? <laughs> this one right here that's underneath mama, I'm assuming. Maybe it's daddy. I don't know. But here it is. You're my footstool. <laughs> and I'll pay special attention to you. I think this is what, at the heart of favoritism, what it looks like. It's subtle most of the time because we just live in avoidance. But this is really what's happening. The problem with favoritism is this. One, it's not like God. This is unlike God's character. God seeks to, to redeem everybody. He desires to see all come to faith. And I don't think that we, we live that way. I think we, in our favoritism, exclude people from that. So this favoritism idea is not the character of God. Second, it undermines the gospel. Remember what the gospel is? It's that story, the redemptive story of God who came to earth and dwelt amongst us as Jesus Christ, who then was crucified and rose again, defeating death and opening a way to relationship with the Father. That all could have salvation, that none should perish. That is the heart's cry of God. And when we have favoritism like this in our life, when we treat people out of favoritism, we undermine the gospel. Instead of focus, focusing on the greatest need, we f I think we think this way. If only they would change, they would be more acceptable in society or in church or in my group. If only they would change, then they'd be more acceptable. I wonder, is that really the heart we're supposed to go to? I think it undermines the gospel when we're more worried about changing their outside than getting them in a relationship with God who wants to change the inside. And, and ultimately, the third thing that this does, it destroys our witness. The world is watching. And I'm afraid the world is desperate for a relationship with God when they don't even want to acknowledge him. And you hear time and time again, I'd never go to church because they don't love each other. I'd never be a part of that church. They kicked this person out or they didn't let this person be a part of their group or I was just too different. I felt too out of place when I went there. They didn't welcome me. Hmm. It destroys our witness. So we, we've taken a look here and we're, I, I hope that this is challenging your heart to start to think, how do you see people? But more importantly, if I'm struggling with the sin of favoritism, how do I move out of that? What does that look like? How do we move forward so that we can be like God, so that we can represent him well? Well, first, we have to choose love. In that verse, a little further there, it said, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, then you are doing right. If you really kept that, you're doing right. And that one of the key words that I saw in there was choose and keep. Sorry, if you really keep. There's an action on me that says, if you really want to love people, you're going to have to keep this law. It's going to have to be in the front of your mind all the time. As you work in relationship with God, you're going to have to keep that going, loving others. It's important. And how do we do that? The first way is to love people as they are. Rather than looking at the clothing they wear, the tattoos on their face, the piercings, the way they do their hair, whatever it is, the list is long. <laughs> There's a lot of things that we choose favoritism is in. And instead, we love people as they are. Instead of rushing to try to change them to some conforming action, we love them for where they are. And sometimes I know that we are trying to love and we see people caught in sin. We, we read the Bible and we say, they're sinning, they're doing that. And God says, yeah, love them as they are. So my job, God would say, is to transform them. Your job is to love them. Second one would be love people for what they need. It's funny how depending on where you come from, what your cultural background is, what your influences are, where you grew up, what side of town or what clothes you wore as a, as a child and a teenager, that we have a, a tendency to want to see people be like us. Rather than loving them for their need, we love them in a way perhaps where we think, 
How can I get them to be like me? And ultimately, where I think we run into the problem is this. We fail to love when we attempt to help people. We attempt to help them, to change them to be like us rather than loving them so Christ can change them to be like him. We run into this problem. We attempt to help people. Look, I see that you're, you're caught, uh, you got caught stealing some things and now you've been to jail and now you're out and I want to help you never steal again. I want to help you never have to be a thief again. And I want to love you that way. So see, I don't, I don't steal things. So be like me. Instead of going, wait a minute. The reason I hope I'm not stealing is because what Christ is doing in me. He's transforming my heart. And so instead, let's learn to love people how they are, where they are, wherever they are, so that God can transform them into his image. Because on my best day, my image is a far cry from God. I try so hard. I do want to. I want to love God well. But man, there is a problem of sin in my mind, my flesh, that it just comes out at the worst times. And I'm so quick to judge people. I hate it. I hate that about me, how how easy it is to look at somebody who's in a different, whatever position than me, something different, and I'm so quick to go, they're this or they're that, or they're like this, or they don't believe that. I get so caught in the rut Or I say, oh, I want to help them. Look at me. I want you to be like me. Well, I hope that I'm following Jesus, and that's a good thing. But what if Jesus has called him to be a little bit different and still like him? (laughs) To live in different places, and perhaps they look different in the way that they dress, but they still love people well. It's a challenge that that I'm faced with. And so I'm reminded of Ephesians, and I think this this is where I want to just kind of zone in for a second. If anybody had any right to (laughs) discount me, to have favoritism over me, uh, to, to look at me and go, you're not worth it, Craig, it would be our Heavenly Father. I mean, he's holy and perfect. He has all the right to go, ah, I don't think Craig's gonna be worth this one. But in Ephesians, it reminds us of this. But because of his great love for us, God, who's rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. In Romans, we're told that we were enemies of God. Wouldn't God have the right to say, well, you're my enemy? I don't think so. But no, he says because of his great love for us and because of his mercy, even when we were dead in transgressions, he still desired to redeem us through the work of Jesus Christ. It's powerful to have that picture. What if I could see people the way God does? Even in the sin that I've seen them participate in, I still want to love you so that you can have a relationship with God. It's the gospel in action. Verse 12 says this, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Speak and act as those who are free now. You're no longer bound by the identities or the sins of your life. Speak and act that way to others. And so it looks this way, to choose mercy. And it said that final at the end of verse 13, mercy triumphs over judgment. You know what I'm learning about mercy? Mercy. I'm learning that mercy is freeing. Recently, I was, I was really hurt by some words that were said to me. And honestly, many of the statements I think were out of context, just weren't accurate. And I just went home and I was crushed. And I just slipped right into that easy chair of judgment. In fact, I didn't sleep for the first night because I spent the whole night judging this person. What's your problem? Don't you see you're lying? You're wrong. You don't understand. And I'm judging over them. And I'm, then I'm <laughs> plotting ways to how can I say this about you? And, and how can I attack you? And first night, I hardly slept. And the second night, the same thing. And then that next morning, I was out doing my devotions and God kind of grabbed a hold of my heart and said, would you like to put this into practice? I know you're about to speak on mercy. <laughs> would you like to give it a try? 
And I was like, what do you mean? I, I'm justified by this. I am right to judge these things against him. He's wrong. And God said, did you ever wonder if that person's hurting? Did you ever care enough to say, how are they feeling? Were there words that came to you really a symptom of a deeper heart issue that they really need to be loved where they're at? And what I found was it was time to choose mercy. Because what I found about judgment was it feels good on the outside and it feels good in the mind for a minute, but it was destroying what was happening on the inside. Was, I was restless. I was angry. I was struggling through things. And instead, when I said mercy, I said, you're right. And as I began to choose mercy, I began to be freed up. I began to live in freedom again in love. Mercy triumphs over judgment. There's three just really quick bullet points that I think we need to see about mercy. First is this. It's the heart of the gospel. I just pressed into that, that when God saw you as an enemy, he still sought you. When he, you were dead in your sins, he still died and rose again to give you life. Mercy is the heart of the gospel. I need to choose mercy. Second, it breaks down the walls that divide us. If I can start to see people through mercy rather than judgment, instead of choosing favoritism, I say, well, there's somebody new. I wonder who they are. I love to know more about them instead of, oh, they're new and they're different. I don't know. I'm not sure about them. It breaks down the walls. I'm free, ultimately. Mercy frees me to love. Instead of judging them for who they are, what they might do for me, how they could help me, I've been freed up to truly love them because I'm no longer choosing favorites. I'm not being selfish. That's what I want to live like, and it's hard. And this plays out in my life also recently. Yep, it's true. <clears throat> I am a human. I am not Jesus, and I have not perfected living out of my flesh the way I wish I had. And so recently I took a drive up to, to Salem and I was on my way to go and meet some of our missionary friends. And I came into this intersection and I'm, I'm parked there waiting for the light to turn green. And I look and, and there's a homeless community under the bridge next to me. Not just next to me on the left, but on the right. And there's garbage everywhere and there's people everywhere. And I just I just hate it, but I, I don't like it. It makes me sad. And I don't like seeing the garbage. And, and I quickly went into judgment mode. And I felt really good about it, too, for a little bit. Because <clears throat> I really wasn't thinking of it as sin. I was just thinking about, well, there, it is wrong. I don't like to see that there is drug usage happening, perhaps, in this place that I've heard of. And I've, and I've heard of terrible things and harm that happens to people. And I don't like the litter, and I don't like the image of it, and all these things. And so in my mind, I'm just, you know, I'm wrestling with all these things. And, and I'm just kind of disgusted, honestly. And so the light turns green, and I drive away, feeling pretty vindicated. I was feeling pretty good. Ironically, I was in the middle of a missions meeting with one of our missionaries, who just left this week flying to Southeast Asia. And we were talking about our passion to see the nations reached for Jesus and people to come to faith. And behind me, two blocks away, I don't think I saw them through that lens. I was so focused on this missional idea of going out and reaching the nations that I forgot about those in my backyard a little bit. And then God, in his infinite wisdom, at the end of a six-hour meeting as we prayed for the nations and prayed for people groups and just, man, I left so excited about what we were doing and then I got back to the same intersection. But God in his mercy <laughs> did something with me. He held the lights, I think, a little longer. And there I was watching. Again, surveying the landscape, looking at the people, looking at the, the tents. And then... A van pulls up and out step some people who set up food tables and start to feed the people. And I thought, that's so foolish. Why are you feeding them? You're, you're only creating more problem by keeping them living here. And the light turned green and I got on the freeway and for the next two hours, God said, how do you like living in judgment? How does that feel? 
He says, what if those people came to faith today as a result of people showing love toward them? Was that okay with you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was heartbroken, quite honestly, because I just thought, man, it's so easy for me to slip into judgment. But he pressed in at one more level. He says, what if the people who lived under that bridge attended your church? Would you love them differently if they came in the building than you do outside? And I think sometimes we struggle to love the people in the building. But it was hard. It was a hard moment. So I hope that today you leave challenged by something. And, and this was the title I started with. And I want you to do something. If you have a piece of paper wherever you're at, if you printed out the sermon notes, I want you to put the no symbol right here over un lovable. The first problem with the opening of my message is that we assume there are some that are unlovable. And the fact is that all are deserving of love. And God says, you need to see them as all lovable. I hope you're challenged today. I'm going to hand off to our campuses or wherever you are. If you're watching online, we're going to have an opportunity for you to evaluate your heart, perhaps repent just like myself, some of the areas where, man, I struggle with judgment. I struggle with favoritism. Thanks for joining us today.